M had inherited Dr. Dre's beef by signing with Dre. M was now the prodigy of Dr. Dre. Dre left death row. Shug didn't like that. Dre getting back on. Got this, this white rapper that's ended up being the best rapper in the fucking world. Shug had a problem with it. He was like, you know what? That kid need to be with us over at death row. And M was cut off on his way to his seat and all these guys in red shirts surrounded him. And I'm looking at M's face and I'm looking at these guys. I'm like, shit, something ain't right. What was Eminem saying during all this? He was like, man, I'm oh, shit. M was oh, like, this motherfucker's oh, oh. trying to kill us, man. They, what are they trying to do? What do they, what do they want? I don't understand. What do they want? I say, hey, man, they want you to- ...as someone who could solve problems. For example, when his client Mario Johnson had a disagreement with Vanilla Ice over money for the song Ice Ice Baby, Suge helped fix the problem. Took me out on the balcony, started talking to me personally. On the balcony. On the balcony. High above, like 15 floors. He had me look over the edge, show me how high I was up there. You scared? <laughs> I needed to wear a diaper on that day. <laughs> I was very scared. This was the start of Suge's role as a fixer. When a rapper named the DOC wanted to leave Ruthless Records, he asked Suge for help. Through the DOC, Shook met other members of NWA. It turned out that Dr. Dre also wanted to leave NWA. Once again, Shook helped solve their problem. They were able to get out of their contract. And that's how one of the most famous hip-hop labels began, Death Row Records. It all started in 1991. Death Row's in the motherfucking house! Death Row can be bigger than Motown or Sony. Our Warner Brothers. Death Row is going to be the biggest record company there is. The master plan was to take over the world. If you haven't noticed, Shook went from being a bodyguard to a big shot in the music industry. His label, Death Row Records, became the one others wanted to be like. In just six years, they put out three of the best hip hop albums ever. First, in December 1992, they released The Chronic. Then, in November 1993, came another classic, Snoop Dogg's Doggy Style, which went straight to number one on the charts. Tupac Shakur, after getting out of jail in 1995, became a huge star with his album All Eyes On Me, also released by Death Row Records. By now, Suge Knight was one of the most powerful people in the music business. But he still hadn't left his violent past behind. He dealt harshly with employees who made mistakes, there are stories of him allegedly beating one employee and making another drink urine. Shug also had lots of legal troubles and ended up in jail several times. He also didn't hold back from dissing other label executives whenever he got the chance. I like to say, any artist out there want to be an artist and want to stay a star, don't want to, don't want to have to worry about the executive producer trying to be all in the video, all on the record, dancing, come to Jeff Rock. For a while, Death Row Records became linked with violence. This happened because many of the people Suge hired were either gang members or had sketchy backgrounds. Because of this, Dr. Dre decided to leave Death Row. The official reason given was a contract disagreement. But some reports suggest Dre left because he didn't like the label's image anymore. He also didn't want to be associated with the kinds of people now connected to Death Row. All these people around me, how many of them do I really need? Suge ensured that Dre left the label without any of his publishing or masters. The only thing Dre got was his walking papers. You have a multi-million dollar company, maybe worth a billion dollars or so, and you own it 100% and don't have a partner, and you'd have to give him nothing. But his walking papers, that's great. A lot more than the public knows. The record business is, is to me, the worst business you can be involved in because any Joe Schmo from off the block can make a record, which means you're gonna have more cutthroats involved and more shy. Shook made sure that when Dre left the label, he didn't take any of his songs or recordings with him. All Dre got was his walking papers, which means he left with nothing from the label. Mostly just the way the studio was, you know, and that's where I have to spend most of my time. Oh, East Coast, West Coast, nonsense is just getting ridiculous, you know. It's just like another form of black on black. Dr. Dre didn't want to be part of the tension between the East Coast and West Coast rappers. He just wanted to focus on making music and collaborating with rappers from both sides. Dre left Death Row and started Aftermath Records. Luckily, one of the first artists he signed was Eminem, who became one of the most successful rappers of the 2000s. 
Dre signed Eminem to Aftermath on March 9, 1998. Aftermath records started slowly, but things really picked up once Eminem was signed. Eminem sold more records than anyone expected. Shook wasn't happy about this, because while Aftermath was thriving, Death Row was declining. Tupac had been killed, and Death Row never reached its former success. Shook felt like Eminem should belong to Death Row Records. So, at the Source Awards in 2001, Shook decided to show his presence and performed with D12 at the show. But at this show, artists weren't allowed to have their bodyguards with them. This left Eminem vulnerable. According to Eminem's former bodyguard, Big Naz, Eminem found himself surrounded by Suge's associates at the show. Walking to his seat, I'm standing off to the side, and M was cut off on his way to his seat, and all these guys in red shirts surrounded him. And I'm looking at M's face, and I'm looking at these guys, and I'm like, shit, something right. If you don't know, wearing a red shirt is a sign of being in the Bloods gang, the same gang Suge Knight and his friends belong to. At the event, Eminem wore a red shirt and got into trouble. Big Naz had to rush down to help him before anything bad happened. Big Naz said that these men had a message from Suge Knight. See all these guys talking about death row, motherfucker, death row, death row, motherfucker, death row. So by this time, I, I cut in, I step in front of him, I push the guys back, I'm like, yo, what the fuck going on here, man? He said, death row, motherfucker, this, this, this death row about, this death row life. I was like, Death Row, what's it got to do with him? He said, hey man, Suge sent him a message. Eminem found himself stuck in the middle of the fight between Suge and Dr. Dre. He was Dre's protege, which means he was like Dre's student, and he got involved in their argument because of it. I got him up out of there, took him backstage. So now, backstage, I'm calling Dre's bodyguards, I call Dre, and look man, we got a serious issue, man. Death Row is here and they trying to fight, they trying to do whatever they gonna do. After Eminem got into a conflict with DMX, Big Naz managed to get him out of the building safely. What was Eminem saying during all this? He was like, man, I'm oh, shit. Whoa, was whoa, like, this motherfucker's whoa. trying to kill us, man. They, what they trying to do? What do they, what do they want? I don't understand, what do they want? I say, hey, man, they want you to sign with them instead of, instead of being with Dre. But what's even more puzzling is that even though Suge wanted Eminem to join Death Row, he claimed that Eminem's music didn't matter to him. What do you think of Eminem? Is that is it? What do you think of white rap? Well, you know, I don't, I don't. It's, see, one thing about some the ghetto is is, is colorblind on a sense. If you really from the ghetto no. and you really doing those things you rapping about, and you talking about, I can respect that. Right. If somebody else writing your rhymes, uh, somebody else is you telling somebody else's story, that really don't mean nothing. 